spit. God puts spit in your mouth for a reason. It's not from the enemy. Saliva is not from the devil. Imagine if you didn't have any lubrication, didn't have any spit, didn't have any saliva. Boy, man, we'd be all dried up and withered like an herb. Hey, God gave us a great lube lubrication system. It's a miracle, really, it is, you know, how you can keep producing so your lips don't dry out, fall off, right? <laughs> oh, man, the world's making a big deal about germs. Amen. You can, you can use your, your body as a temple of the Holy Spirit, and you can use it for the glory of God to heal and to bring forth God's plan on the earth. Amen. God built us as a temple. And what a temple's for is for the business of God to be accomplished. God uses temples. And he's the one that came up with the whole idea of a temple. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 that the body of Christ is the fullness of God that fills all in all. And that we're a holy temple, a habitation of God by where he dwells by his spirit in us. And so that's an amazing revelation right there. God wants us to know that he wants to prepare us to be a place for him to dwell. Amen. And he's also preparing a place for us in heaven that where he is, we may be also as well. So wherever he, he wants to be among his creation. He wants to be in everything that he created. Amen. And so he created us for his glory, and we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So, you know, everything we do in the Lord is like God operating through us like a temple. You know, God uses temples. That's, that whole idea is from God, not from man. Man builds their own shrines and their own idols, but God dwells in his own temples. Amen? And so we worship God in spirit and truth because He's in us, and we're in him, and let's get going. Amen? Praise God. So I don't need this. <laughs> Hallelujah. So God is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. So let's open up with a word of prayer. We're glad you're here today. You know, we're here because of God, because we follow the Lord, and because uh, what God does, what God births, what God plans, everything is for his glory. And the Bible says, whatsoever is born of God overcomes. So we're just overcoming. That's all we're doing is overcoming till he comes. We're not just occupying only, but we're overcoming and are occupying through hearing the word of God. And so God wants his church to be edified. He wants his church to be built up. He wants his saints to be perfected for the work of the ministry till we all come into the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Amen. So we can be filled with the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. So as he is, we can be just like him in this world. And that's the plan God has for the temple, the body of Christ, where he dwells. You know, he's called some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some teachers and pastors for the perfecting of the saints. Amen. And he said that every single Christian has been given a measure of faith has been given a ministry gift, has been given a manifestation of the Spirit to profit thereby. And so it's very profitable for every Christian living a life in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's a profitable life. It's an overcoming life. It's a faith life. And it's a justified life. It's the life God has ordained for us to live. No matter what it's like around us, what the world's doing, God's got a plan and God's got a kingdom, and the kingdom of God shall be forever and ever. But the world and its desires will pass away. But he that does the will of God, like I always say, shall live forever. Amen. So we just want to do God's will and please God, live for God, worship God, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. We just want to be temples where God's settling in on us, and, and uh, we're walking with him, and we're living for him. And until he comes, uh, we're overcoming and occupying. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so i got to back up because I'm on the camera, eh? <laughs> it's like those uh, hydrostatic uh, 
little uh, lawnmowers, those John Deere ones. You just got a lever for going forward and a lever for going back, eh? So amen. Praise God. We're going to have a good time today. Now uh, We're going to talk about some things, and let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness today, and Lord Jesus, we thank you for your lordship over this house. Thank you, Father God, for your saving grace and for your powerful blood and for your mighty word. Uh, we just ask you, Lord God, to touch our hearts, open our eyes to see, and open our ears to hear. Help me, Lord, I pray. Move me with your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we can turn in our Bibles. Last week I was talking about, does anybody remember? I was talking about being persuaded of better things. That no matter what you're going through, faith always has better things. Faith is a better thing life. Faith is a better way life. Faith is always an overcoming life. Faith is the victory, the Bible says, that overcomes the world. Jesus said, have faith in God. Because that's very important to know what it means to have faith. Because faith is a substance of things hoped for. Faith is an evidence that you know you're going to get what you have believed God for because you've heard it from him coming from his word. So faith comes by hearing the word. And there's lots of things about faith. But the just shall live by faith. So faith is a very important subject in the mind of God, in the word of God, in the spirit of God. Amen. The Bible says that we have the same spirit of faith. Faith is also a spirit. There's a spirit of faith. There's a gift of faith in the nine gifts of the spirit in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so we can see how faith is such a very important thing in God's relationship with mankind. Amen. Because they had faith, they could inherit the promises. But I'm going to go to that scripture again. We're going to read that. We're going to move in the word with that and take off onto some different branches and and we're going to teach the word of faith today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. This is the word of faith, Paul said, which we preach. And then he went on to explain it. You know, faith is confessing that Jesus is your Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Faith is believing in the heart and confessing with the mouth. That's what faith is. I believe and I confess. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we confess today as we're worshiping God in spirit and truth singing those songs, we were believing what we were singing. That's faith. That's a faith worship ministry where you're believing what you're singing because what you're singing is based on the Word of God. And faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. Faith is in worship. And that's why worship pleases God because it's a faith thing. It's a thing that's personal in the heart of the one that's singing unto God. Amen. And so praise God, uh, even in times of trial and tribulation and testing, the Bible says we can offer a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, uh, giving praise unto God. That's called the sacrifice of praise. That takes faith to do as well, amen? Because no matter, you're going to still hear from God no matter where you are or what the world's trying to put you through. Now they can throw you in a prison, but you're still going to hear from the Lord. Paul and Silas were thrown in the prison, but they heard from the Lord, and they started praising God and offering up a sacrifice of praise. And then all of a sudden, through a little bit of time and patience, the place started shaking, and they got set free, amen, from their captivity. So, hallelujah, exercising biblical faith in your praise will set you free from the prison you're in, amen? You can be set free from that prison you're in today because God's faithful, and He's a faith God. He's the one that said to have faith in God. Amen. And then he explained it and throughout the whole Bible, hallelujah, he says, you know, you can enter in to the rest that God has for you. No matter what the world's doing to you, you can enter into that rest right there. I think we should just praise the Lord, Paul said to Silas. I think we just need to enter into our rest. By faith, we have uh, this thing with God that God has given us supernatural keys of overcoming. Keys that release power. Keys that bring angels to your rescue. Keys that we learn in church. Keys of faith. Glory to God. And so there's these keys. And it takes patience to learn these keys so that faith and patience can inherit the promises. 
Hallelujah. So we can see that uh, even in the book of Revelations, what comes out of your mouth activates, activates spiritual realities. What you say activates atmospheres. You can even see in the book of Revelations when a, an angel uh, lifts up his hands to heaven and he shouts like the thunder and all of a sudden seven more thunders shout back at him. Because what he said activated the realm of the supernatural, activated the realm of, uh, uh, of things that we don't know too much about. But he, when he said with a loud voice like the roaring of a lion, it says, we were reading that yesterday. That was in Revelations chapter uh, 12, wasn't it? Amen. There was this mighty angel that came down with a rainbow in his face and his face was shining like the sun. He put one foot on the earth and one foot on the sea and then he lifted up his hands to heaven and he roared like a lion. And then all of a sudden, seven roars come back at him. Hey, is it seven or five? But all these roars of thunder come back to him because what he said, and then John was going to write down what these uh, five thunders said. Five or seven, I can't remember. You've got to read it now. It's in Revelations 12. <laughs> this is good. We can just get into the Word today. And Are you talking with me? I mean, look at this. This is how powerful it is that uh, our voices, moved by God, activates more activity in the supernatural realm. That's why Paul and Silas said, we're not just going to take this. We're going to sing unto God. We're going to praise God. We're going to activate our voices to heaven. And then an angel came and got them out. <laughs> is there any coincidence there? They sang praise. They activated supernatural things. They had keys. And then an angel came and got them out of prison. Hallelujah. There's lots of things. That's why God really puts a strong emphasis on faith and the confession of the word and the work of the tongue. The work of the heart and the work of the tongue is the work of faith. Hallelujah. We believe with our heart, we speak with our mouth. And that is what faith is all about. Amen. Believing and speaking. And so we can see how speaking and believing activates more correspondence from heaven. And so we see that God uses the tongue. Amen. That's how powerful the tongue is that even Joel prophesied that in the last days God would pour a spirit on all flesh and they would prophesy. That means they would start speaking. They would start, they would start activating supernatural things on the earth because the Spirit of God came upon them and they couldn't just sit there and not say anything. They had to say something because they had to respond back to God. When God says something to us, He wants to hear something back from us. Amen? And when we say something to God, we want to hear something back from God. Right? Amen? It's voice activated. And so that's how it works. Prayer and then receiving from God. Waiting on the Lord and hearing. And then God says something to us and He wants activity. When He pours His Spirit upon us, He wants us to prophesy. He wants us to declare. He wants us to praise. And then it just keeps on going back and forth and back and forth and synergizing with supernatural energy and power. And we can see that even with the angels. They said something and all of a sudden five things come right back at them because of that voice activated confession. And look at this. And so, uh, chapter 12 here. <laughs> no, it's chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10. I'm going to read this. <laughs> and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with the cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. A rainbow upon this angel's head. This is a holy rainbow. This is a godly rainbow. This is a rainbow of revelation. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven Thunders uttered their voices. Thunders uttered their voices because of his voice. And it happened with Paul and Silas. Their voices uh, activated voices that would come down and deliver them. Amen. And the angels came to Paul and Silas and 
Glory to God. And same with Peter. But look at this in Revelation chapter 10. Seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven. And he swore by him that lives forever and ever, who created heaven and things that are in there, and the earth and things that are in there, and the sea and things that are in there, that there should be time no longer. So this angel just turns the valve on time, and there's no more time after that. Glory to God. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Well, what do prophets do? Prophets prophesy. Prophets preach. Prophets declare the word of God. And what they're declaring has activated things to come, things that will come, things that promise by God that must come. Amen. Things that will come, amen, and things that God's promise must come because the prophets have voiced it. God gave the prophets to believe in their heart and to confess with their mouths. So this word of faith activity is believing and confessing by the Spirit of the Lord. And every time you release a word from God, every time you say something, to God in prayer, it activates something that must be accomplished. It must be accomplished by the word of the Lord. Glory to God. That's how powerful faith is when you understand that it's believing in the heart and confessing with the mouth under the anointing of the Spirit of God, hearing the word of God. So faith is, is, is uh, taught to us by God and it has a way of operating. It has a a nature to it. It has a spiritual reality to it. It has a lot in the Bible to teach about it. Or it wouldn't be in the Bible. That word faith wouldn't be in the Bible. God put that word in the Bible. No, it's not a movement. It's the will of God. Amen. And you can call God a movement then. But some people think somehow faith is a man-made thing. All those word of faith people. It has nothing to do with those word of faith people. It has to do with the way God taught us how to live. Amen. I'm not ashamed of how God has taught me how to live in the Bible. I'm not ashamed about how God has given us faith to overcome the world. I'm not ashamed of that. That's not, you know, anything that's outside of that is just dead and religious and not effective. Whatsoever is not done of faith, the Bible says, that's how important faith is, so that even anything that doesn't have faith in it is sin. Amen? Faith is personal. Faith is a personal relationship with God by where you believe the right way and you speak the right way. Amen? That's a personal relationship with God that affects your believing and your speaking. And when you're born of the Spirit of God, you're born because you confess that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, and that's how you get saved. That's how you get born again. That's how you get to be in a position to receive the Spirit of God so that you're a new creation and old things passed away and all things have become new. Amen? So what's passed away? The way you used to think and the way you used to talk. And so now you think different because you're with a different person. He's influencing your way of thinking and your way of talking. And so you understand that a prophet is just somebody that has a personal relationship with God and they know how to talk right. Amen? They know that their voice in the Spirit of God makes a difference in eternity, from now, forever. And they know that. Glory to God. They know that what they say, God shall surely bring to pass. Hallelujah. And so God says, if you say it, you know, he will bring it to pass if you're saying it under his direction. If you're not saying it under his direction, then that's a false prophet. But a true prophet is someone that has a real relationship with God through the new birth, through the regeneration of the working of the Holy Spirit, and the washing of the water of the Word of God, and the blood of Jesus, born again, bona fide, born again believer, and has a fellowship relationship with God in the Spirit, 
and uses his voice in the world to declare the will of God. Amen? And so whatever promise God has made, uh, we have uh, a divine right uh, to say it uh, and to believe it uh, and to expect it to come to pass. Amen? Glory to Jesus. So, hallelujah. And that's what it says in the Revelation. It says that all these things God did is because it was declared first by his servants, the prophets. Even God himself says, I'm not going to do anything until I get you to say it. And then when you say it, we'll get it done. Amen? And so it says right here, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he has declared to his servants the prophets. Amen? Okay, so why would you call somebody a prophet? Now, if God's declared something to a prophet, you know... Uh, uh, what has that guy been going around saying? So if God has declared something to the prophets, that is their subject matter for their sermons. That is their preaching of the word of God. That's what a prophet is. A prophet is someone who prophesies. Amen? Amen. <laughs> And Jesus told every believer to be a prophet. Jesus told every believer to be a prophet in the sense that we should be saying what his word is saying as it comes to us from the Spirit. Jesus said, whatsoever, amen, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them because you have said something and you will get them. You've said something in your prayer. Remember what you said in your prayer? Hallelujah. God's come to me many times and said to me, remember what you said in your prayer? <laughs> he doesn't forget your prayers. And so I remember what I said in my prayers. And God holds you accountable to what you say. Jesus said that very clearly. He said, by the words of a man's mouth, he'll be justified. And by the words of a man's mouth, he'll be condemned. So be very careful, Jesus said. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you hear. Hallelujah. And so it's very important that God's trying to teach us how to live uh, supernaturally in cooperating with him in how he works and how he does things. And so in, Math, in Mark chapter 11, verse 23, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe what he says, he shall have whatever he says. If he shall not doubt in his heart, but he shall believe those things which he says, he shall have what he says. So Jesus, in that sense, is teaching people how to operate and get God to cooperate. When you yield yourself to the Lord and get born of the Spirit of God and you begin to say things that God says, he will do what he's revealed to his people as a prophet. So everybody who's a believer, who has the authority to speak to a mountain, is in the same sense a prophet. And here's God saying, all these angels, all these things being fulfilled in the book of Revelations, should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Wow, that's powerful, eh? God's saying, I'm going to do what I said to you what you've prayed and prophesied and believed, it shall surely come to pass. Listen to those words very carefully. The mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. Hallelujah. Better things to come. Better things to come. And so the prophets are declaring that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory as the waters cover the sea. What are the prophets declaring? You must be born again if you want to see the kingdom of God. What are the prophets declaring? Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. If I say that and someone believes that, then it shall be finished according to the word of the prophet. It isn't God who's preaching the gospel. It's you and me that are. And God says, if you preach it, I will manifest it. 
If you believe it, amen, I will demonstrate it. And so that's what God says in his word in Revelations. And I'm saying that's a principle that's taught throughout the whole scriptures. That's the principle of faith. Believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth, and what sort of things you desired when you prayed. Believe you received them. Believe you received them. When? When you prophesy them. When you pray them. When you declare them. Believe you receive, Jesus said, and you shall have them. Now these prophets in this Bible here, we're, going, we're, we're on Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. 11, 7. That's easy to remember. <laughs> 11, 7. And so God said he will finish what he has said that was declared to the prophets who said it through him. And so sometimes we just think God's going to do it all, but God says, I'm only going to do what I told my prophets to prophesy. I told them to prophesy it. And look at why God told John to write down the whole book of Revelation. It's because God's going to do it. God's going to finish it, just like John wrote it. Amen. So God's using mankind to work with him to declare. Noah preached that the flood was coming for 120 years, and God did it. God did it, just as Noah was prophesying it for all those years. God did exactly what Noah was telling everybody he was going to do. Well, where did Noah get that from? He got it from God. He was a servant, and he was a prophet, because he was declaring the will of God to the whole nation, to the whole world. They didn't believe him, but it didn't matter to Noah, because Noah got in the ark, and he was protected. Faith not only gave him the power to declare what God was going to do, but they didn't have any patience to believe it because of time. Time messed them up. It's never rained before, and you're, you're a nutcase saying it's going to rain. Time messed them up. But faith doesn't mess, time doesn't mess faith up. Faith is an eternal reality. Faith is now, and faith is eternal. Faith looks into the eternal realm, and faith in faith, one day is like a thousand years. In faith. That's why Jesus said, when you're in faith, uh, you don't look at what you see, you look at what's unseen. Because what's unseen is eternal. What's seen is temporary. So when you pray something and you believe something, you don't just look at the temporary situation with your eyes in the natural when you pray. Faith looks into the eternal that God will finish what he has begun and he will complete what he has said. Surely he has spoken it. Surely he will bring it to pass. That's what Jesus taught his disciples in Mark chapter 11, 23. That if you don't doubt in your heart and you believe the things that you say, they shall come to pass. And whatsoever things you desire in verse 24, you believe when you're praying and then when you have faith, Time is irrelevant because faith doesn't operate in time. Faith is timeless. Faith is timeless. And so faith has the answer now, even though in time it might come. But as far as I'm concerned, I got it now when I prayed because my faith uh, is timeless. So I received it by faith now. And hey man, if I go to heaven before I get it here on the earth, it's still been received by me from God. It's still mine. Hallelujah. And so I gave evidence to that faith, right? Faith is the evidence of things not seen. So what happened was my faith gave evidence that I believe I received when I pray. I, I believed and I did not doubt in my heart, but I said those things and believed those things were going to come to pass. I went my way, believing God, amen? And there was a difference in the realm of the Spirit. There was a difference in all eternity. Eternity was changed by faith. Oh, it's too hard to believe. Well, it's in the Bible. It's simple, really. You've got to believe it. It's not, you're not expected to be, have a natural understanding of it, but you're supposed to be spiritually minded, having an understanding of it, because it's the reality about God. 
It's a mystery that's revealed to us. Christ in us is a hope of glory. That's a mystery to the natural man, but to the faith person it's not a mystery because faith believes. Amen? And so faith isn't uh, irrational. Faith isn't based on foolishness. It's based on the facts that Jesus rose from the dead, you know, and that's a fact. But Jesus is saying all those facts that he created, all the facts of his healings, people were going to die, people were lepers, people were blind, people were sick, people were dead, and Jesus changed those bad facts. The fact that, you know, his daughter, the daughter, Jairus' daughter had died, that was a bad fact. But Jesus changed that fact and said, she's not dead, she's only sleeping. And he went all the way with faith and brought her back from the dead. Amen. And so later, now that we have those facts, Jesus is teaching us that's what faith is. He's not teaching us to believe something that he didn't do that we don't have any record of. We have facts that teach us faith. Amen. My faith life is built on the facts of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so Jesus changed the, the hard facts of sin, the hard facts of death, the hard facts of sickness. Amen. Let's look at the book of Job for a second. You know, look at Job. Look at what happened to him. Amen. How he died of old age and full of days because Jesus came down to give the devil a lesson that you don't mess with a believer. You don't mess with somebody. No matter how much you put them through, they have faith, they have patience, and they will inherit the promises. God will always come through for you. Amen? Sickness doesn't come to teach a Christian a lesson. Disease doesn't teach me a lesson. Jesus came into my life to teach sickness a lesson, to teach disease a lesson, to teach fear a lesson. Everything Job went through, Jesus came to to teach it a lesson that you ain't going to overcome a righteous person if they stay in faith. Glory to God. And so that's what Jesus taught. He taught the devil a lesson. And some Christians teach that, oh, we learn from the devil, we learn from sickness, we learn from... No, Jesus came and taught the opposite. He taught sickness, you don't have a hold. Leprosy, be gone. And so wasn't he a hard lesson teacher to the sickness and disease of the world? He just went around kicking them out of everybody. Amen? He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So faith has uh, eternal value. Faith uh, is doing the impossible based on the facts of who God is and what God has said. Amen? Hallelujah. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 6. And uh, we're going to go into some teaching now. I'm just going to go through some scriptures with you. But Hebrews chapter 6, I thought that was kind of cool because this is, when you read the Bible, I learn from the Bible when I read things. There's, there's actually mysteries in there. Uh, nothing just happens in the Bible by accident. There's principles that are operating. There's supernatural uh, things that you just don't know living in the natural world. Before you were a Christian, it must have been boring. But when you're a Christian, I'm telling you, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When you become a Christian and you get filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, the Bible says that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom. That's the prayer for the saints in the book of Ephesians. Paul, once he found out that they were uh, in faith, once he found out that they were in love, that they had faith to Jesus and they had love for one another, that they were a real church that was sanctified by the Holy Spirit, washed in the blood, the next thing he says, I'm praying for you that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. How boring life is without any spiritual understanding. When you get born again, your eyes get open, and Jesus, like you said to Nicodemus, when you're born of the Spirit of God, you will see the kingdom of God. Amen? You'll see the kingdom. So I started seeing the kingdom after I got born again. And so it got really exciting, and it still is exciting for me today. That's why we come to church, because in this world it's dull, it's dumb, dumb, it's boring. But in the kingdom of God, and in the church, and in the things of God's word, is so exciting and invigorating. So God edifies us with his word so that we can endure 
the hardnesses of this world until the end comes. So thank God that he gives us a little bit of, we don't have to just, you know, go through this life grumpy, go through this life miserable, go through this life with just hardships. No, we get to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We get to have faith and patience and expectation to inherit all the promises. Now let's go to some scriptures real quick and then I'll close in prayer. But I want to go to chapter 6 here. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work. You see God, see what happened? Right here, just like in Revelation chapter 10. See what happened here? Just like voices of angels activated thunders. You know, it, it, it's just like, oh, I'm telling you. Like, that's how voice works. Like, I'm talking to you, and you can hear me, and then you respond back. But also, in the natural and in the spiritual, it works the same way. I mean, when I'm talking to somebody, I can even say, you know, I can walk down a mall, and I can say, hey, Jim, you know, to a crowd of people, and you'll get some heads. Look, I'll get a response if I just say, hey, and I can pick any name I want. But that's, just try using your voice and see how it works, you know. It works. It does things. It might not work good, but it is the principle of getting attention of beings. Beings get attention by voices. It's words. It's in the natural. It's in the spiritual. So that's why our angels, they, we get their attention as well when they hear us prophesying God's word. The Bible says that the angels hearken unto the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord is coming from you and I. And you know that. We've been taught that in our, in our Bible studies on, on Christian living and faith living and supernatural living and biblical living. Amen. And so here you see, now if I'm saying uh, our, our voices activate supernatural responses like Jesus taught us. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, and then Jesus said that's what will happen. The mountain will be moved and cast into the sea because it's activated by the authority of your voice in the name of Jesus. So here we have Jesus teaching us how voices get uh, God's attention, how voices get people's attention, how voices get angels' attention, how voices get even, uh, I mean, the thunders. The thunders were talking. John wanted to write down what the thunders were saying, but the angel said, no, seal up what they're saying and don't write that down. So all those sinners were saying something and getting a response out of John, and he wanted to write it down. But So we can see, but listen to this now. I'm, I'm going on to something a little different here, though. But God is saying to those who are in faith, those who believe in his goodness in the land of the living, those that believe that God is a yes and amen to his promises, God. You know, uh, those that take comfort in the love of God, take comfort that Jesus died for you, he shed his blood. He's not going to leave you nor forsake you. He's not going to let you go. You've got it made in the shade and God wants you to know. He wants you to know you got it made. So act like it. He wants you to know. Amen. He wants you to know. Amen. Hallelujah. He wants you to know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He wants you to know that you're accepted in the beloved. He wants you to know that you're his workmanship. He wants you to know that you're sealed by his blood. He wants you to know that you're redeemed. He wants you to say so because you know so and that you will do so. But we're seeing here in this chapter as we're believing God for better things, we're persuaded of better things, we're moving ahead, we're, we're not going back, no matter how hard it is. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Even your work and your labor of love gets a response from God. Not even, not just your voice, but your work. Here is what the anointed prophet is saying through the scriptures here. He's saying that God has activated, his attention is moved when you're working for him. He knows those that are his. He knows those that are working for him. Even if a little, even if a glass of water is given to someone just in the name of the Lord, the Lord remembers it. It's activated in heaven. Our work coming to church has activated the heavenly realms. 
I straightened out chairs when I first got saved. That's what I did. That was my ministry. I made sure all the rows were straight. And every little chair that I straightened out activated God. He was not unrighteous to know that. The angels knew that I was moving those chairs for God. They knew I wasn't just in there. I was a servant of the Lord. And so whatever small thing you do in the name of Jesus is activated in God's remembrance. It's activated to God. It is remembered by God, as we see in the scripture here. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed towards his name, I just want to do something, Pastor. You know, I love Jesus. I don't want to, I don't want to go out into the world and live. I'm done with that life. I have repented from my sins, and I'm born again of the Spirit of God, and I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I'm baptized in the body of Christ. And I just want to do something, Pastor. Anything I can do. He says, well, you can stay after church and straighten out the chairs. I says, praise God, you know. Because I've got love in my heart, and I want to express it. I want to labor. I want to labor in love. Not labor in doubt and unbelief. Not labor in bitterness and strife. Not labor under the burden of the world. But labor in the blessing of God. Labor in the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So anything that goes wrong, God takes care of it and will compensate it back to you anyway. Amen? devil comes after you one way, God will make him flee seven ways. And so here I am straightening out chairs and not realizing it, you know, when you're just doing the smallest thing and nobody sees, you know, you're wiping snotty noses off of kids in children's ministry. And I did that for a while too, you know. But it was all because Jesus is great. Amen. And I love him. And he saved me. And I have nothing else to do but work for him now. I mean, what am I going to do now? I mean, he doesn't want me to sell drugs. He doesn't want me to do anything. He doesn't want me to live that way anymore. And so I just thought like I was living like a king. I had the best job in the world just to be able to, in the house of God, King David said he would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And that's how I felt. Man, you got to give me something to do, Pastor. You know, I want to I stay in this church. I want to, <laughs> this is my home church. So, you know, straightening chairs and teaching Sunday school and then ushering. Oh, that was a blast. Ushering was fun. You know, it's fun living for God. Amen. And so God's not forgetful. Even when you had to run downstairs and miss a whole church service because you're cleaning the plumbing in the men's washroom. Happened to me one time. I went to a church and I wanted to hear the message and everything. I had to go down and there was a flood in the basement. And I had to fix everything and I never got to hear the message. I never got to be in the service. Where was I? I was downstairs fixing the toilet, Dennis and myself. <laughs> if you're watching, you remember that, Dennis? We were down there, and we were laughing our heads off. We were just having such a great time with the Lord cleaning, <laughs> cleaning that mess up. Because uh, God does not forget what we do. It says, uh, verse 11, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Verse 12. That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promises to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you. Listen to that. Surely blessing I will bless you. Yeah, when God told that to Abraham, when God told that to Abraham, it was 25 years later that he heard from God again. <laughs> How do you like to wait 25 years before you hear from God and the last thing you heard from God was, surely blessing I will bless you. Faith and patience will inherit the promises. Faith is eternal. Faith doesn't operate by time. <laughs> And so, amen. Not hearing from God for 25 years in faith, that's just like a second. But to the natural, it's like an eternity. But in the spirit, it's just like that. Faith and patience. Patience is understanding the timelessness of faith. So that whatever you've got to do in the natural to get prepared, 
you got time to do it because faith is the victory that overcomes your world. Amen. Amen. So you got time, man. You got time on your side if you've got faith and patience. The world doesn't have time. Time's running out for the world. But we're just getting started. We're living in eternal. Jesus said, He that believes on me shall not perish but have eternal life. He that believes on me has eternal life. That means we have an eternity to live in, starting now by faith. So faith is eternal, and we live in an eternal perspective. Our faith sees things that are eternal, not things that are temporary. When we look at someone, we pray for someone that's sick, we don't see, uh, we don't see just a temporary thing there. We see an eternal life of God's healing power. His healing just didn't come in at that moment. His healing has always been there. God has always been there. That sickness is temporary. That sickness hasn't always been there. So faith looks at the healing of God as eternal and the sickness of man as just temporary. And so eternal overcomes temporary and that's how Jesus healed people so easily because he was living by faith in an eternal realm. And that's what he was teaching us. He was trying to teach us to live that way and not be affected by the physical hits that we take in this world with our bodies. You know? And so that we can endure the afflictions of the gospel by the power of the Holy Ghost, Paul told Timothy. Amen. So we're going to go to, an, oh, did I finish off what I was going to read here? Oh, no, I didn't. Verse 14. So here's God saying to Abraham, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply thee. Verse 15. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Let's say Patiently endured. Faith patiently endures. Because God said, surely I will bless you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promises. Now, let's go a little farther in Hebrews here. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Because there's a time where the, where the word came and a time where the word's fulfilled, and there's a time of patience. Faith and patience. And so God says, you've got to have patience if you want your faith to work. A lot of people want everything instantly. They want things like a microwave. They want things just now. Faith is now. But the manifestation of the blessing isn't always now. It can be. But patience has a process of working to get you into operating into faith better. The Bible says, after you have endured, you will receive the promise. And so faith and patience, patience is not passivity. Patience is preparation and expectation for the hope that you have from the Word of God. And so the Bible says, let patience have its perfect work. Patience has a perfect work, eh? It says, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So patience is the process of operating in faith. So let's just finish these scriptures here. In, in Hebrews, for you have need of patience, it says in verse 36. You have need of patience. So the Bible talks about the need for faith, but it also talks about the need for patience. The need for patience is just as important as the need for faith. In Hebrews it says, you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For a little while and he that come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. They live by faith, but they need patience to live by faith. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition. We don't throw our faith away. We don't throw our confidence away. but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now Romans chapter 5. Verse 
So I talked about faith and a little bit of the aspects of faith. And now we're going to talk about how faith operates in a world of tribulation. How faith operates in a world of tribulation. Because we're in a world of tribulation, we have to have patience with our faith. That means we don't draw back when things go bad. We don't lose confidence. We don't cast it away. We're of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And here's what it says in Romans chapter 5. Verse 2. By whom we have received access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse, 13, verse 3. Look at this. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope makes not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. It says here, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience. So we're in tribulation now. We're in a tribulation right now. We're not in the great tribulation. We're not in the tribulation of the end of the judgment of God upon mankind. But we're in tribulation. Every believer is in some kind of tribulation because Paul said in Romans chapter 5, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience. And so patience is connected with faith, and patience is the preparation of faith's manifestation. Hallelujah. And so we have tribulations. We have hardships. And so how do we use our faith in times of opposition and obstacles? Does our faith only operate in the here and now and in the nice and sunny, easygoing days? No, because once you begin, now let's go to Revelations again. Once you begin in faith, not only do you activate the attention of God, not only do you get God's attention, you get uh, all the evil in the world's attention. Yeah, you do. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That's the devil. They overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So we're in a tribulation now. Whether it's the great tribulation or not, it says that we operate even in tribulations, knowing that when we're in tribulations, we exercise patience, and patience is what keeps our faith alive in tribulation. Patience keeps our faith alive in tribulation because we have an eternal perspective on faith, that faith sees beyond the tribulation. Now, let's go to, uh, we're going to go to Revelations with this last verse. This could have been my first verse, but it's a good one for the last one, too. In Revelations chapter 14, verse 12. Revelations 14, 12. This is what I'm trying to get at. But it's so excellent talking about faith and talking about what Jesus said about faith and talking about how faith is activated by believing and speaking. We get that truth from Romans chapter 10. And Paul called that the word of faith believing with the heart and speaking with the mouth. And then we found out that also God is activated when our faith works, when our faith straightens out chairs or our faith operates a soundboard or our faith comes and gives, our faith worships God, our faith sticks with the body of Christ for the work of the Lord on the earth today. We see that God's not unrighteous to forget every work that you've done, that he will reward you because you serve the Lord Christ. And we saw that in Colossians chapter 4, and that it says that, you know, uh, you serve the Lord Christ and you shall receive the reward of your inheritance. Amen. So don't be weary in well-doing uh, because you shall reap if you faint not. So this is a teaching on how your faith works in tribulations by exercising patience. 
We need to learn how to exercise patience because we go through three things. It doesn't seem like your faith is working, but when it doesn't seem like your faith is working, uh, it's because our thinking's not working right because faith is eternal. It's in the now, but it is an eternal thing. Amen? So you can actually put your patience with faith uh, and you can wait on the Lord and be of good courage and what he has said will surely come to pass. So we have to exercise patience. We have to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God until he lifts us up. Amen? And so, you know, we're on God's time. We're on an eternal time. And a second to the Lord seems like 10 days to us, you know, or a year to us. But it's only a second. And faith is a substance of things hoped for, which has an eternal value that does not get affected by time. Doesn't get affected by time. So one thing... I learned from the Lord in all my life of living for God and living by faith and living through trials and hardships and temptations and tribulations. One thing I've learned from God is that you will outlive your trial like Job did. Amen. You will outlive it. I was so down and out and didn't know where I was going. And faith is always positive and always knows that, hey, God sent Jesus into this world that you might live through him, that you might have life and have it more abundantly, right? He has promised, surely, blessing, I will bless you. And so when it's raining out and it's, it's dreary and dull and depressed, things don't seem like they're working right, faith really sees beyond that and above that. And when you get into faith, you'll hear things from God that'll encourage you and cause you to rise up and stand on the mountain top. And I saw, you know, just nothing but despair before. I, you know, I never had any physical, natural evidence. I had no guarantee that I would ever be where I am today in life. I had no guarantee that I would go to heaven. I had no guarantee that I'd even be saved. I had no guarantee that I'd ever have money for a car or a house. Or, I had no guarantee that I'd ever be married. The only guarantee I've ever had for what I have now is the word of God. I've never had any natural guarantee. Because every time God promised me something, it was never when it was looking that way. It was always the opposite. So I learned one thing from the Lord in whatever he's saying. Surely I will bless you. He's saying that to everybody. He's saying that to the whole world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life, and you can be fully persuaded that when you receive Jesus as your Lord, you can expect better things. You can expect better things, but you've got to understand how patience works to inherit the promises through faith. And so when God said something to me when it didn't look like that, I realized many times that God knows more about what's going on than what's going on knows. I say, you know, whatever's coming against you, it don't know what God knows. It don't know what the Lord knows. <laughs> I tell you, you just got to get to know what God knows in your tribulation. Because the Bible says we rejoice even in tribulations also. Because tribulations work patience. And patience is the time period that you have on this earth uh, to learn more about operating in faith. Learn more about doing the will of God. Learn more about yielding to the Spirit of God. You learn more. You humble yourself. You learn more. You serve the Lord. You just keep on keeping on in patience like Job did. You know, he just kept on. They told him to give up. Throw in the towel. Curse the Lord. Die. Die. Get it over with. No, I'm not going to die. When you feel like you're going to die, if you're in a hospital bed right now today, I say to you, you're going to live and declare the works of the Lord. You need to tell yourself, when it looks like you're dying, no matter what kind of sicknesses and disease you've got, no matter what kind of hardships you're going through, say right now, I will live and declare the works of the Lord. And so that's because God's word is for you beyond the temporary situation that you're living in. Because God knows what's going on more than what's going on knows. And so I learned that. That's an eternal faith thing. And so when I begin to operate that way and act that way, I could make myself a lot happier, a lot easier. And so praise God, I don't need my friends bringing me down if they're not in faith, if they don't know what it means to live by faith, they don't know what it means to rejoice in the Lord always. Always means always. And they don't understand that eternal perspective that I'm blessed because God said so. I'm blessed because God said so. 
Amen. I'm a nobody. That God made a somebody in front of everybody without consulting anybody. Get that. That's what you are too. That's what Abraham was. He was a nobody that God made a somebody in front of everybody without consulting anybody. (laughs) God doesn't have to consult the experts to bless you. You just need to have faith in him and know that patience is your best friend. Patience is your best friend. You can dwell, you can abide, you can learn, and God will provide. Now, I'm closing with this in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Read this with me, please. Here is the patience of the saints. So the saints have a patience to them, right? And we don't like that because patience means not getting your answer right away. You know? Patience means you're getting your answer. God's promising you. God's saying, surely. But patience is operating in time when faith is eternal. So faith receives it as it's done now, but patience has to wait until it surely comes to pass. Amen. Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. It doesn't say you'll have them when you pray. It says you have them by faith when you pray, but you shall have them in patience and in the right time. You will have them. You will have them. God told me I was going to go to Mexico. You know, how many years? Uh, He told me I was going to go to Mexico and preach the gospel. He showed me that in 1988. And it wasn't until 2000, and when did I go to Mexico? 2013? When I, I cried unto the Lord. I said, that's a long time, God. I said, you, I thought I was going to go to Mexico, and I cried out there. And it was amazing that I was right at the edge of my breakthrough, right at the edge of God surely bringing it to pass. And that moment, you know, when I remembered what God had said, and then I, that same day just, How many minutes later, I walked across the street, ran into a Spanish pastor who asked me if I wanted to go to Mexico with him in a couple weeks and preach the gospel. And I'd just be reminding the Lord about that. I said, it's been a long time. I think that was in 88 you told me that, God. And now it's like 2013. (laughs) But you know what? You should believe God when he said it the first time, right? And so through faith and patience, we learn how good God is, that what he had said, his love has never, ever, ever died out. His love, hallelujah, is wonderful. His love is eternal. God's love in our heart by the Holy Ghost. In Romans 5, it says, because his love is in our heart by the Holy Ghost, we can have patience and we won't be ashamed if our prayers aren't answered instantly all the time. But we can still go around saying, I'm blessed. We can still go around saying, I'm going to have. We're going to go around saying, better things are for me. Oh, hallelujah. We can still go around prophesying what we have heard from the Lord he was going to do. Amen. And so I heard from the Lord I was going to marry. I heard from the Lord when I was praying in the Spirit. I saw what my kids were going to be doing and everything. That's because faith is in the internal. When you're you're praying in faith, like Jesus taught in Mark chapter 11, verse 23 and 24, he says, when you pray and your desires will be there from God and you'll hang on and you won't draw back and you'll believe to the saving of the soul. Now here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What do we do when we exercise patience? We keep the commandments of God. We just do what God says us to do, knowing that he's not going to forget what we're doing. We're just going to say what God tells us to say, knowing that it's activated something right right at the time that we say it. We're going to say what we pray. We're going to pray what we're going to say. We're going to do what God tells us to do. This is the patience of the saints that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. So what do we do in patience? We keep serving the Lord. We keep saying what God says. And we keep living by faith and not by sight. Amen. And God has better things for us. When worse things came my way, even though the devil was trying to mess me, God was always trying to bless me. And that's the same way with you. It's the same way with anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Whatever's trying to mess you up, God's trying to bless you up. 
God's trying to get you up and out of that miry clay, and you keep on telling. Let the enemy know that you've got a table presented before him by God. In Psalm 23, it says that he will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. That's like patience. Your enemies are all around you. They're telling you what they're going to do. And you just got a table set up and you're just going to, you're going to eat your stew. You're going to have your pie. You're going to have a good time. You're going to read the word and pray. And you're going to sit and not worry about the enemy and get them even madder at you. Because God's put that table before you in the presence of your enemies. That's patience. That's patience. When you can eat in front of your enemies, that's patience. Because you know the story. You know the ending. Amen. And so the more we read the word, like, I mean, you might be at a work site that's really hostile and toxic. Well, God's going to prepare a table for you right there. He doesn't have to take you out of that site. He can just bring himself on site with you. Amen. So you can outlive your enemies. You can outlive your problems. You can outdo anything the devil's trying to. Amen. You're better. And you're a lot more better looking than the enemy, too. And so praise God, you can sit there and enjoy the goodness of the Lord. You can enjoy the word of God. And so we're teaching faith today on how it's believing in the heart a certain way and talking from the mouth a certain way and knowing that everything you do, God is involved in it. And that's the patience of the saints. We've got to exercise patience in tribulation. We've got to know that tribulation works patience. And then we'll get some experience. And what's experience going to teach us? It's going to teach us what we needed to learn about faith. So when I got saved, I started coming to church and exercising patience because I couldn't live by faith very well. I didn't know much about faith, but I exercised patience to learn as much as I could. So I kept coming to church and I kept listening to tapes, kept going to as many meetings as I could. That's patience. I wasn't operating in anything, but I was operating in saving faith. You know, I got saved by faith and And so I needed to exercise patience. And it took me years and years and years, you know. And now we're we're, we're starting our international school of ministry so that, you know, the perfecting of the saints can exercise patience and learn the word of God. And God will use you according to what he has put in you. And so as much as in you is, you're able to do the will of God. Hallelujah. So God's not a God that's going to make you do anything that he hasn't produced in the first place. And so God will work in you to do his will. Remember that. God working in you to do his will. Father God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for another time with our listeners. Thank you, Father God. Let your blessing flow like a river to them. Let joy come like a fountain. Let love pour out on an ocean on them, Lord God, today. Father God, release, uh, Father, your power inside of them today in joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'm asking you, Lord God, to make them strong in you and the power of your might today. I'm not asking you to change their situation, their circumstances. I'm asking you to be a, a stronghold in them. I'm asking you to be so strong in them that you will terrorize their enemies and they will flee from them. They will flee from them in Jesus' name. I want to see your enemies fleeing today because you're not fleeing. You're standing in faith, operating in patience, rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. And so, Father, I just pray, Lord God, for that breaking through today of every believer that's not drawing back. Father God, I encourage everyone, Father God, today in your word, Father God, to have faith and patience. Because what you've said, you will surely bring to pass. You have blessed everyone that's watching me right now. And so, Father God, I just thank you, Lord God, that they have heard and that faith will come alive in them and your blessing will be manifested in the midst, even in trouble, even in times of hardship. Help us, Lord God, to endure. As it says, and after they patiently endured, they received the promise. So I pray for the patience of the saints today. A lot of people need patience out there. I need patience. Things are tough. Times are tough. There's no doubt about it. The Bible says they are. The Bible says tribulation is not a good word. There's no tribulation in heaven. Tribulation is coming from the devil. I want you to know that. He's stirring up things against you, but God's, hallelujah, God's stirring up things for you. God is giving you the victory today by faith. And so, Father God, bless them until we see each other again, Lord God, that we can give them the 
the word of faith. We can give them the encouraging word of the Lord. We bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost today. Fill everyone with the Holy Ghost. Help us, Lord, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.